Hey everybody, Spiceman here from Airwing 11. Well, we didn't get our Tomcat for Christmas, so I uh, figured I would make another Tomcat video. Um, since we don't have our Tomcat, might as well talk Tomcat. Um, you know, I did a video um, with the cold startup procedures kind of focused on the front seat. So I thought this time um, I would talk more about the back seat startup, a little bit about the, the avionics. And in addition, uh, for this one, I'll, I'll we'll bring it out to the boat and we'll talk uh, some boat stuff and uh, some squadron stuff, some day in the life, you know, stuff in a Tomcat squadron and, and whatnot. Um, also, so as I mentioned, you know, I don't have a, a cockpit to sit and click in. So this video is not meant to be um, you know, an in-depth, you know, click this switch and look at this light and, you know, that sort of thing. Since I don't, simply don't have a cockpit um, to do that in, I'm sure, you know, the professional YouTubers out there are probably getting um, their advanced copies of, uh, of the, of Heepler's Tomcat and, you know, they'll start putting out <clears throat> videos like that. You know, I'm not a professional YouTuber. I'm not trying to, um, you know, do a video like that. I'll, I'll leave it um, to those guys who do it, you know, extremely well. Um, and also, you know, I'm an F-14A guy. I was in um, VF-41, which exclusively flew uh, the F-14A only. VF-41 actually went from the F-14A to uh, the, the Hornet, the Super Hornet. So we never had anything other than the F-14A. So I'm an F-14A guy. I'll be talking F-14A stuff, which Heepler, you know, isn't coming out with initially. Now there's, you know, 80, 90% overlap between an F-14A and a, and a B. You know, the AUG-9 is still at the heart of it. Um, it's all, it's pretty, it's pretty similar. So, you know, if you understand the A, the B will come to you as a, as a, and a snap, right? So, but I'm going to be talking exclusively F-14A. Um, oh, on that whole F-14A, A plus B thing, um, I know that officially in the annals of the U.S. Navy, there is no A plus, right? There's an F-14A and an F-14B. Um, but there were certainly airplanes that, you know, us guys in the fleet called, you know, the A plus. Um, a little story on that. So I was in VF-101 for three years and, uh, you know, VF-101 being the RAG has a little bit of everything because they got to train guys going to all the different squadrons out there. So we had some planes that were in various stages of upgrade and the upgrades didn't happen all at once, right? So an airplane usually went to Norfolk, the Naval Aviation Depot, Grumman ran a, uh, the depot there in Norfolk, and they'd go there and they'd get, you know, the new engines, the, uh, uh, you know, the F, F-110s, and uh, they would come back, and they still had old avionics, and then uh, crews, uh, contracting crews, would come out on site to Oceana, and there were certain levels of upgrades that they could do there on site. They would come out, um, and they would do... Um, they'd put new radios. I think the ARC 182s uh, came out, and they would upgrade the airplane with that. They would upgrade the ALR um, 67 there on site, and there were some upgrades that they would do. It went out, wouldn't be a full um, F-14B at that point. It wouldn't have the new TID with the digital bus, uh, you know, that sort of stuff initially. And that's what we called an F-14A+. It was kind of like, you know, the new engines, but the old avionics. Um, and and then they got the new TID at some point. I didn't really see much of those. Because even though I was in VF-101, I wasn't in the avionics shop the whole time. I actually did my first year in the avionics shop. But the second year, I was in troubleshooters. And my third year, I was in um, QA. So I didn't actually spend all three of my years in, in 101 in in the avionics shop either but the only point there is um 
you know, there were different combinations of engines and avionics out there, and there were planes that we called um, F-14A pluses and F-14Bs. So while officially in the Navy history books, there's an A and a B, um, there was also an A plus. I wanted to clear that up because I saw some talk on forums or whatever that there yeah, was never really anything called an A plus. Well, yeah, there was. Um, to us in the fleet, there certainly was. But but anyway, so I'm going to do this video um, on the F-14A and it's not meant to be a really in-depth video. I'll let the professionals do that. This is really meant to be more of a kind of an overview um, just to kind of get your feet wet, so to speak. So I'll take a chance on being boring here. I, you know, I couldn't find um, a good video on the web of anything backseat related. I, I couldn't even find really um, a lot of pictures. Um, it seems like people get close to a Tomcat. All they want to do is take pictures of the front seat. There's not a whole lot of good um backseat pictures out there so I'll, I'll i'll take a chance on um on boring you with just me yakking in some still pictures but uh but we'll see how it goes so so like i said we'll bring it out to the boat um and oh a little bit about me i got some questions after i did that um cold start video of hey were you in the navy did you work on tomcats so so yeah, it's a little bit about me. So this is yours truly here um, back in 1987 um, on the Nimitz in VF-41. So I joined the Navy in 84 um, after a couple of years of uh, school. Um, I went to school. Well, I went to boot camp in Great Lakes, uh, avionics A school in Memphis, Tennessee, Millington, and then got assigned to VF-41. So I reported to uh, uh, Oceana, Virginia Beach. And before you go to your fleet squadron, you go to an F-14 specific training program called FRAMP. I think it stands for Fleet Replacement Aviation Maintenance Personnel. It's a bunch of classes you go through specific to um, the F-14. And um, if you have time to spend waiting on a class to start or, or whatnot, you do some... Uh, on-the-job training at VF-101, the RAG there. So I did some of that. So did that for three or four months, I think it was, and then reported to VF-41 in January of 86. So I was in VF-41 from 86 to 90, did two deployments during that time period on the Nimitz and on the Roosevelt. Went back to VF-101 as a squadron guy from 90 to 93. And then actually went back to VF-41 again from 93 to 95. So that was my career. Um, so this is on the Nimitz. Our shop on the Nimitz was um, off of Hangar Bay 3, the aft most Hangar Bay there, um, sort of outboard. Um, that was a nice shop, actually. It had these angle irons here, which is good for um, storing spare parts that we kept in the shop we kept spares for um you know frequently changed um items or things that were hard to um, go and get a spare from aimd and get it changed in the 15 or 20 minutes or so you have to change a part um on a on a turnaround so parts like that we kept spares um in the shop so like this is a VDI converter here. This is the box that generates the display um, for the VDI. The VDI in the cockpit is really just uh, the dis actual display. It doesn't do a whole lot of processing. That's all done uh, in the VDI converter. This is a TACAN RT down here and it's a toolbox. And behind there, um, this thing is a jet checker. So um, whenever a plane goes down to the hangar, it's got to be completely de-armed. And so um, in order, the jettison system basically consists of a uh, something called a squib, a little explosive device gas generator that uh, screws into the um, into the, um, the missile launcher rail or the rail that the drop tank hangs on. <clears throat> They've got squid squibs in them. Um, 
when you do select jet, it sends a voltage pulse down to that squib, which explodes, and the gas is used to release hooks or push down, you know, ejector feet. The, the missiles are actually ejected from the airplane through some ejection feet. Um, but before you can put those squibs back in, you have to do a jet check, um, and that's what, what that is. It's just got a little um, adapter that goes into the the threaded hole that the squib goes into and you you basically trick the airplane to think it's in the air um, you um, you have a little jig or you can even use a screwdriver for the weight off wheel switch um, and then you, you you simulate you know an ejection a, a, a jet you know you select the, the station hit the select jet button uh, and this makes the look looks for that um, voltage pulse down down at the connector there for the squib. So that's what that is. Um, uh, this picture here is the only action shot I could find. This is actually out of a little squadron newspaper called the, um, uh, oh, what was it called? The family gram that uh, they sent back home to the families every uh, couple times during a, a deployment. I managed to make that family gram one time, so. It's only action shot I have. I think I'm I'm changing an IMU in that picture. The IMU is up in that bay. I, I, actually, I must be because this is the little torque wrench we used for the IMU. The IMU was, was torqued. I think it was like 25 inch pounds, and that's a little torque wrench. So I must be changing an IMU in there. But anyway, so yeah, so that's me. Um, also important in this picture, I know because we're wearing dungarees. Um, you have to wear your dungarees whenever you're in port as soon as uh we get to sea as soon as they raise that anchor um we all change into our flight deck greens uh here's some flight deck greens um a couple other guys from the shop it was gerald and bh from the shop in that particular picture that was out of our cruise book our 1987 Nimitz cruise book but anyway that's what you wear on the flight deck but interesting also interesting enough in this picture behind them is the ea3 B, the whale. Um, that was a plane that met the ship when you got to the med. It was from a squadron BQ-2 that was based in Rota, Spain. So they didn't, you know, live on the ship the whole the whole time. They kind of flew out once you got into the med, and they spent time on the ship. But this particular um, airplane here actually wound up crashing. Um, during this cruise, uh, it was early in the cruise, so it couldn't have been too long after this picture was taken. If you've ever seen um, uh, this video here of this crash on the Nimitz, right? so that was that whale that was in that picture. A um, little, little controversy around that. Um, that uh, that barricade was not rigged properly. If you look at this picture, um, when that thing is catching a barricade, if you look at that barricade, that's an unsat barricade rigging job. Um, that thing is seriously um, sagged. I think the um, investigation uh, sort of measured that visually from the photograph and determined that was only about 12 feet. Um, a properly rigged barricade um, stands at least uh, 20 feet tall. So that barricade was not rigged properly. This is a properly rigged barricade. So a little bit about um, rigging the barricade. So when you rig the barricade, it's an all hands on deck kind of thing. The announcement comes over the, the 5MC, which is the uh, loud speaker system on the flight deck, you know, rig the barricade and it's all hands on deck. Everyone runs to where the barricade um, stands. And then uh, what they do is a uh, a tow tractor will come and there's a hatch in the junkyard uh, where the barricade is stowed and they open that hatch and the tow, tow tractor drags out the barricade across the deck along with uh, the purchase cable. The purchase cable is basically the fifth um, arresting wire that's specifically for the barricade. And al along with all that, a bunch of guys grab these um, these ramps, these deck ramps that latch into um, places along the flight deck there. Um, so everybody runs out there. They drag out the barricade, the purchase cable. The guys are laying these ramps down. Everybody then uh, grabs onto the barricade and you spread it out. 
they attach the um, the upper horizontal strap and the lower horizontal strap to the stanchion that's still laying down. They attach the purchase cable. Uh, these this this uh, sort of fifth um, arrestor cable stanchion comes up out of the deck, and they attach the purchase cable um, at either end. Uh, and then they and then uh, everybody still got a hold of the barricade, and they make the call, pull to starboard, pull to starboard. And everybody, after they get this hooked up, they pull um, to the starboard, right, so that they can um, hook this end up and sort of take the tension off, you know, just from what the guys holding the barricade can sort of do. And then there's a guy over here that takes a wrench out. I think it's also stored in the in the hatch where the barricade is stored. It's a pneumatic-powered wrench. I think they call it a air air boater or something like that um, and it puts uh, and it um, cinches up this top and bottom cable here through this pulley system uh, and uh, it cinches it tight and then they raise the stanchions up the guy in the back of the boat that runs the arresting gear engines he uh, he tensions up the um, the purchase cable um, and then the barricade is ready to go. But in this particular instance, they either couldn't find or that air boater wasn't working and they couldn't properly tension the barricade here. And they raised it without that um, proper tension on it. And so it was sagging like that. But but that's sort of how they um, rigged the barricade. Um, but back to the uh, the guys on the on the flight deck here. Um, talk a little bit about um, the IFF. It's a good picture to kind of do that with. So, um, so he's got this pouch. Yeah, these pouches here are just tool pouches. Um, this pouch here is the Mode 4 IFF pouch. It's got the Mode 4 gun, and he's holding up fingers there for um, fingers uh, at the Rio. So what? So what that is is the Mode 4 um, IFF. So the way that um, we'll go through the IFF system um, on the on the Tomcat. So uh, here's the various parts of the the IFF system. Um, so the IFF transponder, the APX72. There's a receiver transmitter. That's this guy here. Uh, he resides in the port main avionics bay. A lot of there's a lot of avionics in here. This is that. VDI converter I was talking about. This is the box that generates the display um, for the VDI and the HUD. Uh, this is the MDIG processor. This is the guy that generates the display for the HSD and the ECMD. But this is the APX72 um, transponder here, this this guy. Um, so. So you have a transponder in the interrogator. The interrogator, the APX76, is in this panel here um, next to the port main avionics bay. Um, so for IFF, you know, we get you got modes one, two, three, and four. Um, those codes are entered in the control box here up, up in the cockpit. Um, the mode one code um, was a code that um, and via, in our air wing, we use that code. It's kind of a general purpose code. You, you know, different air wings can use it for whatever you want to use it for. Our air wing used it to, um, it was set for what type of mission you were on or what strike package you were a part of. It's a two digit code, um, each digit being zero through seven. Um, they would use mode one for that. Mode two uh, was set on the front of the um, receiver, uh, the transponder. You can't set this from the cockpit. And this code was uh, four digits. The first digit was for your um, air wing. So like we were CAG-8, the first digit would be an eight. And then the next three digits would be the modex, right? So if this was um, VF-41 aircraft 101, this would be 8101 that we'd set uh, in the uh, in the receiver and the transponder. So that's mode two. Mode three is like the code that air traffic control gives you, right? Air traffic controller says, uh, you know, squawk 7142. Well, that's what you put in here. This is mode three. And then there was a mode 
Charlie. And Charlie was your altitude reporting. And so you didn't enter a code for that. It was just altitude reporting on or off. And these switches here is where you enable um, your modes one, two, three, and and Charlie. So you turn mode Charlie on, you're enabling your altitude um, reporting. Mode four was the encrypted mode, right? So um, mode four, you simply turned on or off. There's a switch here to turn mode four on. And mode four is a code that's punched into uh, a key box. There's two of them. There's one for the transponder, uh, one for the interrogator. It's a kit and a cur. I think the kit was for the interrogator and the cur was for the uh, transponder, or maybe it was the other way around. I can't remember. But yeah, you got to have a kit and a cur. And then you have a kick, which is the encoder. So, and that's what um, he's got in this pouch right here is the kick, the mode four encoder. It was a physical thing. Um, it's a it's a it's a gun, you know, that you know that the this piece here kind of telescopes back and there's sixty four pins that stick out of this thing. Metal pins. And you open it up and each of these sixty four pins can be set to a, a different length. I don't remember how many different settings there were, but um, these, each of these pins would be set to a, a different length. Um, and then you would shove this kick into, into the kit and the cur. The pins would go into these holes, and there were female pins in here. Um, and so that's how you set the code. You took the, you took the mode 4 gun and you shoved it into the kit and the cur to kind of set, uh, set the code. Um, and so, uh, and then you also, in order to test before on each launch, a guy would come around with a little handheld interrogator. Uh, this this thing here, um, it was a sort of a duty that rotated around the air wing. I think well, each each week, a different um, avionics shop from one of the squadrons got uh, got the duty to be the mode four interrogator guy, and you'd walk around the flight deck to the planes that were getting launched with this thing. Um, and you and you it was a little handheld mode four interrogator. Uh, and for mode four in the cockpit, um, when you're when the airplane is replying, if it gets a response and doesn't reply or doesn't re reply with a, let's say that there was no code set, there's a, a, a caution light that comes on in the rear cockpit uh, or, and or audio. There's a switch here in the control box to say that uh, for it's got audio out and light. So light is saying I want to see the light. If I'm not replying, out means basically disable the warning and audio says I want a, an audio tone um, if I don't reply to a mode four interrogation. So the guy is interrogates, he's down um, at the back of the plane on the on the left hand side the IFF antenna is actually in the left ventral fin and he's basically asking the Rio hey the guys interrogating you um, mode four are you are you seeing the light uh, and so that's kind of what they're what they're doing there as part of the launch um, so that's kind of how the IFF works this is the APX 76 the uh, interrogator um, control box. Um, it's basically, you can interrogate any code. So it's got thumb wheels here. You can choose a mode to interrogate. Uh, and if that mode, you know, involves a code, you can choose which code to interrogate with. Um, and you can see if you get replies. And those replies show up on the DDD um, as in the form of bars above and or below your your target. So if the target is responding with a, with a proper mode, you'll get a line below. If it's responding with the proper code, you'll get a, a line above, right? So if you only see a line below, it's like, hey, the guy is responding um, with uh, with a in, with the correct mode, with the correct format, but we're not getting the correct code, and so there won't be a line above. But there's a, and you can get um, the radar might not be happening to pick up that target, but you might actually get uh, 
uh, an IFF response. And so it is possible that you'll have uh, the bars for above and below, but no target video. And that's like, hey, I, I, the radar can't see a target out there, but uh, somebody um, at this, uh, you know, azimuth is responding, you know, uh, with the proper mode and code, even though the AUG-9 isn't picking up a target. So it comes in useful. Um, Mode four, you know, for obvious reasons to um, to determine whether a target is are friendly, hostile, or, or unknown. Um, uh, but also, if you're getting multiple targets, you can go ahead and um, interrogate mode three. And if you want to find, you know, your squadron mate out there in 102, you can put 8102 in there and then see which one of those targets is responding with um, with uh, the proper response for 8102 well that's aircraft 102 um you can you know um, identify targets that way um, a target responding um, with emergency is the in the master mode switch um one of the modes there is emergency you know if you're having an issue you know if you're declaring an emergency or whatever um and that will show up on the ddd as well because you send multiple pulses out there when you're responding um, with emergency it's a it's a it's a set code it's 7700 is the emergency um, code and i also think you send four uh, response pulses when you do that and so if you're if somebody's responding with emergency well then it, it shows up with multiple um, horizontal bars uh, the other thing uh, with IFF is that uh, you can choose, there's an antenna switch there, you can choose auto antenna or lower antenna for the um, for the uh, IFF uh, transponder. If the uh, Rio was getting an IFF light when that guy on the deck was re was interrogating him, one of the things he can try and do is force the antenna to the lower and see if that helps. But So that's kind of the IFF system. Um, on the Tomcat. The uh, interrogator antennas are on the AUG-9 antennas. So these gray um, dipoles here on the AUG-9 antenna are your APX-76 um, interrogator antennas. So a little bit about the, the antenna while we're here. Um, uh, it's hydraulically powered. It's got its own little self-contained hydraulic system. Uh, it's cooled by liquid coolant, stuff called coolanol. Um, there's a couple different boxes in the radar system that are cooled by this liquid coolant, this coolanol. Um, in this picture here, you can see a fair chunk of the radar system, and this is in, is in this bay here. Um, the radar transmitter is up here. The uh, synchronizer, master oscillator, and receiver are below it. Here, the um, the master oscillator is cooled by coolanol. The transmitter is cooled by coolanol. Um, the transmitter is one of those boxes that we kept uh, in the shop. It was a bear to change on a turnaround only because it's so heavy. It weighs 210 pounds. It weighs 170 pounds uh, if there's no coolanol in it. It weighs 210 pounds with coolanol, and it's six feet, you know, over your head. So it, it was a bear to change on a turnaround. Um, 210 pounds over here. It was a two or three man um, job. Um, and we usually kept one stashed up on the flight deck somewhere. Um, our shop on the Nemesis was on the hangar deck. And to get this box up three, four levels really to the flight deck in the 15 minutes, you got to change it on a turnaround. That was a, that was a tall order. So uh, our line shop, their plane captains, that was actually up on the, on the, flight deck level the 03 level so we kept the transmitter stashed in the in the line shack um i think we actually had a cover made for it and, and kept one during flight ops stashed in the catwalk right off the flight deck in case uh we needed one but yeah it was a transmitter that's one of those boxes that was kind of tough to get changed uh on a turnaround but uh other antenna stuff these are the wave guides um this is the waveguide coming from the transmitter. This is the waveguide going to the receiver. The waveguides were actually pressurized. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it's a 10,000 watt radar. There's a lot of voltage potential going through these waveguides and they kept pressurized. You know, pre air is a dielectric. And so as you get higher in the air 
thins out. Um, you could actually get uh, arcing across the waveguides um, when you lost air pressure. So the waveguides are were actually um, pressurized. Um, if you look at the back of the antenna, you know these are all waveguides back here. You know this this transmitter waveguide you know kind of all fans out and um, these are uh, the waveguides back here. And each one of these little slots here is the open end um, of one of these waveguides on the on the back of the antenna. It's called a planar array type antenna. Uh, this orange antenna down here is your missile message antenna. It's for the Phoenix. So, you know, the Phoenix, when you first, if you launch it, right, um, uh, from a, from long range beyond 12 miles right it it's it starts in this semi-active mode right so its initial guidance um, is provided by the aug 9 through missile messages there's a um, receive antenna in the rear of the phoenix for these messages and this is your um, missile message antenna here to send the in-flight um, uh, guidance um, commands to the to the phoenix that's uh, that's what that is uh, the radome is um, raised hydraulically. There is a hydraulic hand pump in the front cockpit of the Tomcat. It's used for a couple different things. Um, it's used to pump up the radome. There's a, a, a rotary valve in the nose wheel well that you um, can turn. And then you, well, what we did, we shoved our screwdriver in there to hold it. And then we went up in the cockpit. And uh, there's a handle here um, that, a little faster unscrews and you pull it down and turn it and it unlatches the uh, the radar. I mean, you go up in the cockpit and you pump that hydraulic hand pump um, to raise the radome. That's kind of how you get that up. Now the, if you wanted to watch the antenna go through its um, uh, test sequence, uh, bit seven is the antenna test sequence. You could, this is the uh, radome down uh, micro switch here, interlock. Um, and there's the fun. The radome has holes in it that line up with these two little spikes right there. And um, flat tip screwdriver, the handle of it just perfectly fits between this spike and that uh, and that micro switch there. You can shove a screwdriver in there and make that micro switch and trick the plane into thinking the radome's closed and uh, watch the antenna if you needed to for whatever reason. Watch the antenna go through its uh, its bit sequence there. But so yeah, a little bit on uh, on the antenna. Those gray dipoles are your uh, APX76 antenna. That's kind of IFF. Um, what else did I have to talk about here? Let's see. Oh, yeah. all right. So let's uh, get this puppy started. So we're going in the back seat. Uh, even actually, even before we get in the back seat, we got some stuff to do. We got to push in. Um, some circuit breakers. So there's some circuit breakers in the back that stay pooled all the time. They're painted yellow. Um, so we got to push those in. Uh, I believe it's, I know it's the C, it's the radar antenna. It's the outboard spoiler mod. It's the elect electro hydraulic pump for the outboard spoilers. The inboard, I believe, are powered by the uh, combined flight hydraulic system, uh, combined hydraulic system rather. Um, and then there's the CSTC breakers are normally pulled. You got to push those in. So the CSTC is kind of the heart of the avionics system. I talked in the last video about the CADC, the central air data computer, which is the sort of the heart of the, the flight control system. Well, the CSTC, the computer signal data converter, is sort of the heart of the avionics system. Um, in the CSDC is the navigation computer. Um, uh, it does a lot of signal and protocol conversion. A lot of systems don't talk to each other directly. They talk to each other through the CSDC. Kind of give you an example. Think of the, the HUD diamond on, um, overlaid on top of a target on the HUD. There's several things it takes to get that HUD diamond on there. Um, the uh, Direction of you know the um, antenna tracking angle from the AUG9 as part of that obviously. Well, um, well the AUG9 is not painting that diamond directly on the HUD display. It's sending antenna um, tracking angle information to the to the CSDC, right? 
um, the CSTC is then taking that um, information um, and sending that to the VDI converter down in the, that Port Made Avionics Bay, and that and that is one of the many sources of information that uh, that VDI converter is using to paint, send that, create that HUD display, and send it up to the indicator in the cockpit. So the AUG9 is talking to the VDI through the CSTC um, in order to do that. Uh, when you're going to paint the uh, the gun pepper up there for um, uh, for the for the gun solution, right? That comes from the radar. There's um, there's wind information coming from the CADC for that. There's INS information coming for that. A lot of stuff is coming into play, you know, for that gun pepper. Uh, the CSTC is the one calculating all that, sending that information to the VDI converter to paint, you know, onto the HUD. So the CSTC is kind of the the heart um, of the avionics system. Um, its circuit breakers are are pooled, and you got to push those in. So the rear is going to push all the circuit breakers in before he climbs in, because squirming around to do that once you're in the jet and, ho and strapped in is a real pain in the butt. So do that, and you, you climb in. Um, and remember, the Rio really doesn't do much until the airplane is started and the pilot runs the emergency generator test. And then once that's done, well, then the Rio sort of kicks into action. <clears throat> so the Rio is going to turn the radar on. The hand control unit is going to move the, the switch from off to, to standby on the hand control unit. Um, he's going to turn the AUG-9 cooling pump on. It's a switch over on the left hand side of the cockpit. He's going to turn that on. If he's carrying uh, Phoenix, he'll turn the AUG-9 and the AIM-54 um, coolant pump on. So that coolant pump uh, cools several you know, components of the, the AUG-9, the transmitter, its power supplies, the RMO. Uh, if you ever looked on the top of a Tomcat and you see those um, heat exchanger outlets inboard of the uh, of the intake, uh, one of those um, is uh, the AUG-9 coolant loop, you know, runs through there. There's two heat exchangers, one's the primary and one's the secondary. Um, there's several functions going on in there. Um, one is it takes bleed air um, from the engines, which is coming at it like almost 600 degrees, and it cools it down through uh, heat exchangers um, in there to, I think it's 400 75 or something like that, maybe 400 uh, for the ECS turbine to then cool down the rest of the way. The the, uh, the ECS turbine basically takes the, the the bleed air that's been cooled to 400 degrees by the heat exchanger, uh, takes it um, and it compresses it and then releases it and kind of like a you know a can of compressed air. You release compressed air, it gets cool. So that's kind of what it's doing. Um, and then that's the air used to cool the uh, the cockpit. Uh, actually, that's the air also used to pressurize the waveguides I was talking about um, before. Now, also, when you cool air, it gets more humid, right? Warm air holds more moisture than cold air does. And so when you cool it down, you got to dehumidify it. There's, de there's an air water separator in there as well. And in fact, if you look at a Tomcat video, they're not usually, the resolution usually isn't good enough to really make it out. But there's a, the there's a port behind the nose landing gear there that's usually uh, sometimes dripping, sometimes pouring water out. That's coming from the, the ECS um, air water separator there. Um, so that's kind of what those heat exchangers are doing that you see on, uh, if you can look at the top of the jet, you see them up there. Um, but also the AUG-9 coolant loop runs through there um, as well. But so that's the um, uh, AUG-9 cooling or the AUG-9 AIM-54 cooling turn the radar on, uh, turn that on. Um, and the kind of the first thing you got to do is kind of get the alignment going. That's kind of, that kind of takes a while. So that's sort of job one is to get the, the INS um, aligned. So a little bit on the INS system. The main part of it here is the IMU. Uh, this is the, the bay right up above the, uh, the gun there. We called it the IMU bay. A uh, couple, a lot of different things in here. There's the IMU. Uh, there's three power supplies for the AUG-9 transmitter. It's a solenoid beam and collector power supplies for the, for the transmitter. Also up in here is, is the TACAN 
um, receiver transmitter, and this is the power supply for the uh, for the TCS, the television camera um, system up in here too. But here's the IMU. Um, it's basically a gyro. It's a precision gyro. Um, it's painted gold. We used to joke that it's painted gold just to remind you how much that thing costs. We used to joke that you know it cost a million dollars. I don't know if it did or not, but it's a very um, high precision um, uh, piece of equipment there. The IMU. Uh, it's a it's a it's a gyro uh, along with accelerometers on 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 the three axes and. If you're not familiar with INS, the way that it works is the very first, you th first initialize it with where it's currently located. It's called local level, and you, you, you initialize it. And the more time you spend initializing it, the more accurate it will be. Uh, but then once it's initialized, it measures its movements on all three axes to gyro along with accelerometers. And so it, it Based on that point from where it started, it measures where it's moving, and it, um, and you know your instantaneous location at every given point because the the IMU is is um, a pre a very precisely measuring your your movements, um, and uses a process of gyroscope has two processes, um, two properties of a gyroscope: uh, rigidity in space and and precession. So. Rigidity in space is that a spinning gyroscope wants to wants to remain in a constant position in space. So it's accurate to say that the airplane is actually rolling, moving around the IMU once it is um, once it's been initialized. So it remains rigid in space. And uh, precession is another property of a gyroscope. Um, it's undesirable in some cases and desirable in others. Whenever you apply a force to an axis in a gyroscope, um, you'll feel an opposing force 90 degrees around um, the direction of rotation. Um, it can be useful in some instruments. For example, the turn coordinator in the in the in the cockpit and um, uses gyroscopic precession to show. You know, when you don't have, when you're, when you're using the rudders and it's showing, hey, I'm doing a, you're doing a two minute turn or a one minute turn to the left or to the right, that actually uses a property um, of a, of the gyroscope um, for that. The AIM-9 uses it. Those rollerons in the back of the AIM-9 fins, well, those are gyroscopes and it, it uses gyroscopic precession as a way to keep the AIM-9 from rotating um, as it's, as it's flying. Um, if those, if the AIM-9 wants to rotate, those fins move. That spinning gyroscope on the back of that fins through uh, through precession will want to turn that fin in the other direction and and stop that rotation. So that's what those rollerons in the back of an AIM-9 um, are for. But um, in a gyro, in our gyroscope here for the INS, it will also lead to errors over time because one of the forces applied to our gyroscope is the force of the earth turning, right? That's applying a force to that to that gyroscope, um, which because of precession, uh, there are mechanisms in there to cancel it out, but it, it will induce errors in that INS over time. Now in the course of a normal flight, you typically don't have to worry about that, um, but uh, for over long duration periods, you may have to update the INS position and we'll talk about how, how you do that because of of that precession error. The other error you encounter in an inertial navigation system is a position error. Um, and that's just due to inaccuracies in the accelerometers and in the physical properties of the gyroscope itself. It's a precision instrument. I mean those errors might be on on the order of um, micrometers per inch or whatever, but over time they add up because um, it's one error every time you take a measurement, you're adding that error onto it, right? So if your first measurement is a micrometer off, the second measurement will be, well, that first micrometer plus the micrometer from the second measurement, the third one will now be the two micrometers before it plus that micrometer, so they just add up over time. Um, and so over a long period of time, you might need to update your position that way. Now, when they integrated GPS into 
you know, the Tomcat and the B, um, I'd imagine that, you know, a lot of those concerns sort of went away. You, you wound up updating um, your position a lot less often, if ever. Uh, but in the F-14A, um, you may find yourself periodically having to um, update your um, your position. And we'll talk about how you do that here in a minute. Um, but yeah, step one is to get the alignment going. And the way that you do that is you turn um, your nav mode to uh, CVA align. Now, um, on the boat, you need to get your ship's position from the carrier. Um, and you do that through the ship's inertial navigation system. We talked about the SINS cable is one way to do that by hooking that SINS cable up. Um, a better way, at least from the maintenance guy's perspective, the tr uh, flight deck guy's perspective, is to get uh, a data link alignment through um, the ship broadcasts RF SINS um, over the data link. And you, tr you, for, you really you try to get it that way. Now, we know that there's dead spots on the on the on the boat where you weren't going to get an RF alignment, and we'd always just haul the SINS cable out. Um, you know, on elevator three, the forward part of elevator three, we knew was a dead spot. We were never going to get a SINS alignment or an RF alignment um, there, so we always knew we had to use the SINS cable. But over on the other side of the boat, like L4 over that way, you could usually get um, an RF alignment, a SINS alignment, and so. What you do in that case, when the, for the, to get one of those on the data link control panel, um, you put the mode switch into Kane's Waypoint uh, Carrier Inertial Navigation System. Um, it magnetically locks um, into that um, location. You want to put the data link on the upper antenna. There's an antenna switch, um, upper and lower, for um, UHF-1 and the data link. They're always on opposing antennas. Uh, so you... Um, you want to put the switch in data link upper, the mode switch to Kane's waypoint, and hopefully you're picking up the RF SINs um, from the boat. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, uh, when you first initialize it, well, uh, you want to initial, most of the time, you, what you want to do is called a SAT, a simulta simultaneous align and test. Because one of the other things you got to do in the back seat is get OVC going. Um, we talked about that in a startup video. And the way that that works is you first turn the AUG9 on, the first thing it does is an auto sequence two. If you go to CVA align before auto sequence two completes, uh, you've got about 15 seconds or so to do that. Um, the system will go into simultaneous align and test, which is the INS will begin its alignment and OBC um, will begin, assuming the pilot has um, the master test panel in the front seat on OBC selected. It'll begin OBC. So that's what you normally do um, as a simultaneous align and test. Go to CVA align before auto sequence two completes. And then if you're getting um, the RF SINs at that point, it'll start the alignment. If not, uh, there's a acronym that'll start blanking here in the middle. And it's called a handset. Uh, you'll get a blanking HS for a handset alignment. That means you're not you're not picking up the SINs. If you're not picking up the SINs um, by RF, well, then you use the SINs cable, and then the handset alignment should go away. If it doesn't go away with the SINs cable, you're stuck with doing a handset if you want an alignment, and you really don't want to have to do a handset alignment. Um, it's basically manually entering in the latitude, latitude and longitude and, and he heading of the boat, which <clears throat> you can imagine how inaccurate that is going to be, right? Rio, even if you write it, write that down as you're leaving the ready room to come to the flight deck, it's going to be outdated. So um, air crews just really did not want to have to deal um, with a handset alignment, certainly at night, because uh, your position is just going to be really inaccurate. Um, imagine, you know, the error you're starting with, with every calculation the INS does, it's, you're going to get farther and farther off. So you do not want to have to. An air crew would rather take a spare jet or launch the uh, the hot spare. Um, you always had a hot spare for most of the launches. We'd launch the hot spare before we had an air crew go up, you know, having to go up with a handset. Um, so really the only realistic option is to get that um, SINs alignment going. Um, but... Assuming the SINs alignment works, you won't have any acronym there, and the alignment will proceed. You've got three tick marks here. 
Um, this is your sort of initializ initialization tick mark. This is um, what we call a ready six, and then the, and the course align, and this last tick mark is your ready seven or your final line. The ready six or ready seven comes from the first digit in the INS flycatcher being a six or a seven. Remember, I talked about flycatchers are basically memory locations. That, they got their name from that first digit of that flycatcher. Um, it'll change to a six at this tick mark and change to a seven at that tick mark, the final line. A uh, course align is, 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 is good enough alignment for um, launching a missile. Um, you can launch a, a Phoenix um, as long as you've reached this ready six alignment or this course alignment. Um, you need a fine alignment if you're going to um, uh, do an automatic stored heading alignment. Let's talk about that for a second. Oh, before I do, this number here is the alignment time in minutes and tenths. So this alignment's been going for 2.0 minutes. But um, let's talk about alerts. Um, we did three types of alerts on the boat. We did alert 5, alert 15, and alert 30. Uh, the alert 30 was set every night while you were at sea. Um, alert 30 is basically you just an airplane that's up. Um, it can be set to be to be declared to be the alert 30. It's just got to be an airplane that's up. Um, you limit the maintenance that you do on it if you declare that to be your alert 30 um, airplane. From an air crew perspective, it doesn't mean anything. Um, the air crew doesn't have to be on any kind of. They they can be in their in their you know bunk in their rack sleeping for alert 30. Um, now for an alert 15, um, the air crew is suited up in the red, hanging out in the ready room for an alert 15. We did alert 15s periodically during you know um, uh, war game exercises that kind of stuff. We would do. Um, alert 15s. Um, I'd imagine the guys that uh, were out there during. I was in. I was in during the Desert Storm period, but I, I wasn't. I was in VF 101 during Desert Storm, so I wasn't uh, uh, actually out in theater. I imagine those guys probably had an alert 15 every night. I, I have no idea, but but an alert 15. The air crew is in the ready room, uh, and to set an alert 15, um, they would have us uh, guys from the avionics shop go up and um, run a fine alignment just to make sure that everything is going to work, that the, that the, you know, we were going to be getting SINs. You'd always have a SINs cable on an alert. You wouldn't take a chance on not getting the RF SINs. I don't care where you were parked. You just had the SINs cable up on there and get a fine alignment and just verify, you know, um, that's working for an alert 15. Now, an alert 5, um, you know, the air crew was in the plane and you start it, you go through the startup process, um, you taxi it up to the cat, uh, in the back seat, you run the, um, INS all the way out to a fine alignment. Uh, the pilot sets the hark parking brake, you put the chains on, and then, uh, you shut the AUG-9 off and, and the INS off. Um, and then you can't, you um, you have an automatic stored heading alignment available to you, but you can't move the airplane. You can't um, release the parking brake. You have to keep that parking brake set for that automatic stored heading alignment to stay valid. And get this, you can't move the boat. It's an automatic stored heading. The airplane needs to stay on that same heading. Those accelerometers need to stay on that same axis they were on when you got that final line. If you move the boat, you've got to, the Rio is going to have to turn the AUG-9 back on and redo that fine alignment. So um, in truth, alert fives aren't stood for long periods of time. Um, I don't remember ever sitting on alert five for more than 15, 20 minutes at a time because you can't you can't move the boat after you align that INS to that final line and still be able to launch in five minutes. Um, if you move the boat, yeah, you can you can stay in there and you can, the air crew can stay in there and you can be on alert, but you're not going to get off the deck in five minutes because. Um, so the way that a true alert five works is you align it to find a line, 
right? You run through the startup, you put the plane on the cats, um, parking brake set, chain it down, shut it down. And then the next time, if you have to launch the Alert 5, right, they'll come over the 5MC. Launch the Alert 5 fighter. Initial vector 040, right? Scramble, right? Everybody scrambles. Um, the Rio um, will turn the AUG-9 on before that thing even boots up. Flip it in the CVA line. You can do it before the AUG-9 is even turned on. Flip it the CVA line, turn the AUG-9 on, right? It'll do its auto sequence to this, you know, your SAT alignment will come up and if the CSDC detects that the airplane is still on the same heading and those accelerometers are still aligned where they were when you did that fine alignment, it'll begin an automatic stored heading alignment. And you'll have a automatic stored heading alignment acronym here um, on, on the TID. Uh, and on the computer address panel, uh, in the nav category, the stored heading align button will light up. You can actually use this button to cancel the stored heading align. You don't use this button to initiate it. You use this button to cancel it. The system initiates it automatically when it comes up and detects that it's met the criteria for um, an ash align or an automatic stored heading align. So you'll get that automatic stored heading. The carrot will jump very quickly um, up uh, through the course align up march to ready six and you'll get a ready six within a minute and a half um, to two minutes and you do not do a final line on an alert as soon as you get that that ready six the rio flips it to ins um, gives the guy on the deck the signal pull the sense cable sense cables pulled by that time obc um, is is done running and you're out of there so that's kind of um, how an alert five and alignment is done um, on an alert five. Another option available, um, once you get to ready six, you can actually flip it to cat alignment. Cat align basically ignores the, uh, the parking brake. In a normal alignment, the alignment will suspend if you release the parking brake. But by flipping the, the uh, nav mode to, to cat, um, it will ignore that parking brake, and you can get a few more seconds of alignment out of the INS um, before you, uh, you have to launch. You flip it to, to INS. But So that's kind of how you um, align the INS. Uh, for a, If you don't have an automatic stored heading alignment, I believe if, you ha if you've had a fine align, it might go faster. Um, uh, if it, um, but you're not going to get a true alert 5 if you don't have that automatic stored heading alignment done and in there. Um, these lights here um, light up as well. When you first, they indicate the stages of the alignment. Um, when you're, when it's initializing, the standby comes on. I think when it gets to ready six, um, the ready light um, comes on there. And I think when it gets to ready seven or final line, the ready light then goes out. And when the ready light goes out and the fly catcher is seven and the this little carrot goes to a diamond here, and it puts a dot in the middle of the diamond here. When you see that dot in the middle of the diamond, you know you got your fine alignment, and you can flip it um, to INS. So, so that's kind of um, how aligning the INS works. So, um, just by reading the post from Heepler, I think they might have actually even modeled some of the degraded aspects um, of the INS. So let's let me talk about that. Um, a little bit. Um, well, number one, let's talk about um, updating the thing. So let's say, God forbid, you did have to launch um, with a handset alignment. You decide, well, crap, I'll launch with this and I'll update um, the INS when we when we get in the air. Um, there's a couple ways to do that. Um, you can do a radar update. You can do a TACAN update, a visual update, and you can even do um, a fighter-to-fighter -fighter navigation update um, utilizing data link. So the way that those work, they all work in a similar kind of way. You have to tell the airplane where a point is, and then you um, use the AUG-9 or the TACAN to tell the airplane where it is in relation to that known point. So let's talk about a radar update. So I want to do a radar update. Um, I'm going to use one of my stored um, waypoints 
you know, the, 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 F, the Tomcat gives you eight waypoints. It gives you three navigation waypoints, an initial point, uh, uh, I think it's a, a fixed point, a surface target, home base. Um, it gives you eight uh, pre-stored navigation points to put in there. Um, you can use one of your three waypoints, initial point or target point, um, as your to do a, a radar update on. So let's say that, or you can enter a new one and use that. So let's say that um, some peninsula out there, some peninsula of land on our map, we know the exact correct lat long for that point of land or a dam, right? I know the latitude and longitude um, of this dam, right? And it's stored in my system as uh, waypoint one, right? So um, I can hook using my hand control unit. I can hook that waypoint one um, on my on my TID, and then I can go find that point on my radar using ground mapping. So I'll go to my DDD. Uh, I'll put it in in ground mapping. Um, you know, I'll do I'll set my um, I'll put it in pulse search, which is what you use for um, ground mapping. Uh, I'll switch it to one elevation bar, set my azimuth scan, right? And I'll and I'll use my AUG9 ground mapping capability to find that peninsula or to find that dam. Um, and I'll put my hand control unit. Um, I'll push the button for for DDD cursor, and I'll put my cur I'll, I'll maneuver my cursor on my DDD. Um, and I'll go to full action and I'll, I'll hook on the DDD, um, I'll hook that dam, right? And so now um, I've got the system knows based on the AUG9 information where I am in relation to waypoint one, right? And when I hook that dam, it'll give me the, the Latin long um, of, of, of where it believes uh, uh, that dam dam is in relation to where I know that stored point is, right? And so if that looks right to me, uh, I will do, uh, I'll hit radar fix on the computer address panel and fix enable. And that will update my INS based on that ground point um, that I've used my ground mapping function of my AUG9 to tell the INS where I am in relation to that known geographical point. So that's uh, that's a radar fix. Another way to do it is through a TACAN fix. Again, I got to tell the airplane where this particular point is. So I will, um, if not already, I will make one of my uh, available waypoints here uh, the lat long of a TACAN station. Let's, let's let's reference it to DCS. Let's say we're in the Persian Gulf map, right? And we know um, where Kassab Takin is, and we know it's Latin long, right? So we will, from one of our waypoints in here, we'll enter the Latin long of Kassab Takin, and then we'll tune Kassab Takin in, right? Um, and so then, so now the air, and I'll, I'll hook the waypoint on my TID that is Kassab Takin. Um, and then I'll tune Kassab TACAN. And so now through TACAN, the airplane knows where it is in relation to this known geographical point, which is the Kassab TACAN antenna on the ground. Um, and I'll go to TACAN fix um, and fix enable. And so now I've updated my system um, uh, with uh, the lat long based on my location from a known TACAN um, location. When you click the fix button, you'll get a readout of the delta between where the airplane computes that it is in relation to this known point um, and where um, and where uh, where it computes that it is and where it knows that the related that the known point is. And if you and if that delta readout is acceptable to the Rio, that's when you hit that that fix enable. So ideally, the delta will be zero, um, and you'll hit fix enable, and you'll have updated your your INS. So that is a uh, attack in update. 
uh, a visual update um, is by overflying a known point. Let's go back to that dam, right? So one of my waypoints is that dam. So I'm going to fly the airplane to that dam and I'm going to overfly it, right? So uh, the pilot flies the airplane. When you get over that dam, you hit visual fix. You'll get that delta readout again. Um, if that delta readout is satisfactory, um, you hit fix enable. And that's a, that's a visual fix. Um, it's probably the one, um, you know, the lowest priority kind of fix you want to do because it's surprisingly difficult to fly an airplane exactly over a point on the ground, especially since, you know, you can't see directly below you or whatnot. Um, I'm guessing visual fix is probably the least one that uh, you want to use. But you can do you can do a visual fix by over flying um, a known point. Um, now, you can also get updates through uh, the data link. Uh, through fighter to fighter data link. So back to the data link panel, um, this address here is that an address that you put in for a fighter to fighter um, data link um, channel. But let's say that you're flying in formation um, uh, with another airplane whose who's INS is nice and healthy and you want to get an update off of that. You can, um, uh, you can have that airplane send you its um, it's a position over data link and you'll see its aircraft symbol right next to yours. It's data link aircraft symbol. It's net aircraft symbol and you can hook it. Um, and if you hook it, uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't have to show in the data link category here, but you flip this to the data link category. And I think push button five here is fighter to fighter nav update. I think that's kind of what it says. So you hook that airplane next to you on the TID Go to data link, hit um, button five here, fighter fighter data link update, and it will sync your two locations together. So you will, his airplane will give you its coordinates to you, and your system um, will sync up its location with with it with that airplane next to you. Um, and so that's a fighter to fighter navigation update. Um, and that's when he's flying, you know, right next to you, because you're going to get the same position that he's got, right? Now, if he's not right next to you, let's say he's out there somewhere, you can still do it, but you do it through uh, through locking him up, right? So um, uh, you'll have his symbol on your TID through through data link. You can hook his aircraft symbol, and then get a single target track on him. Uh, and then in, with, when you get that single target track on them, well, there again, you have a known point, which is that aircraft uh, location via data link. And then you have, you're telling your airplane where you are in relation to that known point because you single target tracked them. And then you hit that data link category button five, fighter, fighter, data link update. Um, and you'll be updating your INS that way by your known by the AUG-9, your, your position derived by the AUG-9 through that single target track in relation to that data link target that you've got hooked. So those are all ways to update your INS um, once you're in the air. Um, and that's pretty much what I wanted to cover about the INS. Oh, a couple more things about if it's degraded. So let's say that the INS is degraded. Um, you you have no means handy to update it, um, but the INS might be still good as a as a gyro. Um, is this just not good for deriving your position off of? You can go to one of these degraded modes here. Um, there's AHARS air mass and IMU air mass. So IMU air mass, you flip it to IMU air mass. You're using the IMU as a gyro but you're not deriving your position from the IMU anymore. The nav computer in the CSDC is going to derive your position based on um, uh, air data through your um, airspeed and your heading. Um, it's woefully inaccurate compared to INS, um, but it at least allows you um, to have some sort of position information available to you. It's um, using the IMU as a gyro, but uh, the CSTC is going to use um, AHARS and the pedostatic system to compute your position. 
Now, if your IMU, if your INS is just no good, and your IMU is you don't trust your IMU, you know, even as a gyro, right? Um, you know, on the video, on the on the HUD, um, you know, you're in visual conditions, you just know your IMU is just not accurate, right? So you can go to AHARS Air Mass, and in this case, you're using the AHARS gyro. The AHARS gyro is your backup gyro to the IMU. So you're saying, look, my, my INS, my IMU is just flat out no good. So you're going to be using your AHARS as a gyro and the CSTC is going to be computing your position based on AHARS data, airspeed and heading and, and whatnot, pedostatic type data. So that's AHARS air mass. Those are the two um, fallback modes from the INS. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover in regards to the INS. All right, so now that we're on the topic of navigation, let's go over um, the ACLS, ILS systems um, on the Hornet. ILS, pretty simple. Got your ILS control box. It's on the pilot's right-hand console. Um, got a power switch and a rotary switch to pick one of your 20 channels and that's about all there is to it it's got a um, bit button on there that you can press and if you got the right display mode on the vdi in the hud you'll see the uh, ils needles come up in a certain preset position and that's the bit test other than that and that's all there is to it let's talk about um for the ils rather let's talk about the display Blaze. Um, so in the front seat, you got your VDI and you got your HUD. Um, this is a VDI display down here. It's ground texture display. Um, we call those things cow patties. <laughs> That's um, on the bottom there um, for your ground texture. Um, you got a mode switch to pick one of five main modes of of display, and then down here. Um, you have steering sub-modes. These five selections here are only for where you want your steering information to come from. They're about the steering information and, and nothing else. You've got five selections. Tack in, destination, AWL, AWL PCD, which is all-weather landing, precision course direction. you got vector and manual. For um, ILS, ACLS, you want to be in AWL PCD. Um, these switches here, well, you got your three power switches. Turn the VDI HUD and HSD on in the front seat. Um, you got um, two switches for the HUD. You can declutter it. And you got ILS or ACL. So this is saying that you can display the needles sourced from either the ILS or the ACLS systems. And same thing for the VDI. Um, you could put it in normal mode or TV mode if you want to look at the TCS on the on the VDI. Um, and you can choose the ILS needles or the ACLS needles. Nor now, typically, what pilots will do is have the HUD in ILS if they're flying an ACLS approach and have the VDI in ACLS. So they'll have the ACLS needles on the VDI and they'll be monitoring it with the ILS needles on the HUD. That's kind of typically what they would do. Um, just to finish this out, on the HSD, you've got switches that can put it in nav mode, which is your typical HSI you know, display. You can put it in TID, which is TID repeat. It shows you the same, um, the screen on the TID in the back seat. And then you can put it in ECM mode, which shows your... Uh, your ECM display, your ECM strobes. Um, if you ECM override, if you have ECM um, into override, whenever you're in a non-ECM display, if you get a, a strobe from the, the ECM system, it'll put it into ECM display as long as there's a strobe present. But that's what the override is for. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, how you would set your displays up. And then... The other thing involved is the uh, flight control system. Um, you've got the ACL mode of the autopilot. We'll talk about when you engage that here in a second. You've got the ACLS control box, which is in the rear seat. Um, you've got these single and double selections here. Are, there's basically 
um, different modes of the ACLS. This is for just want your needles. You know, there's that there's single and double interrogation pulses and things like that. I don't I don't know that we'll have to worry about that in DCS. I think we'll really only be you know, using it in ACLS mode here. Um, and there's a power switch and there's a, a test uh, push button that also um, I believe is a it, it's a light that will also light up whenever the ACLS whenever the spin 42 is sweeping you um, the ACLS um, light will light up um, so that's what that's for the other thing is a is a, is a bit button um, push button as well um, the other component of the uh, of an ACLS landing is the is the data link we saw that control box in the other um, uh, picture but uh, there is a there's a DDI a digital data indicator that's also in the in the back seat on the right hand console um, and there's a bunch of discretes that data link can send you and light up lights on this DDI um, they're kind of like text messages it's in the in the data link world um, uh, you can get various uh, discretes through the the data link system and there's a set of discretes that are specific to an ACLS landing and those discretes are also repeated on the the VDI um, so there's a um, the one specific to uh, to an ACLS approach uh, there's a there's a DDI repeater on the front of the uh, of the VDI for those um, for those discrete. So we'll look at those two. So the way that um, an ACLS approach works is that uh, the spin 42 and the controller, you know, on the ship will pick a channel for you to sort of be on, and they'll get their system set up, you know, on the boat. Um, and then when they're ready, they there's a data entry thing that the controller does, um, and you'll get the landing check light come on, and that's typically somewhere within 10 miles before uh, inside of 10 miles, but before eight miles or so, uh, the the system on the boat will um, pick a channel for you and get the system configured and send you the landing check discrete, um, and then. The system is basically scanning. The spin 42 antenna on the boat has a conical scan pattern. Uh, you'll see the light, you know, flash as that system is sort of scanning you, um, and then it'll eventually lock up to you. And by lock up, what happens is that the system on the airplane is called the beacon augmenter. It will take what's coming in from the ACLS and echo it back to the receiver. Um, on the boat and um, by echoing back the interrogations from the spin 42 the system locks up to you <clears throat> and it locks up to a specific point on the on the airplane um, I've got this picture here just to show this antenna here on the on the chin pod below the TCS camera this is the ACLS antenna. And so when the ACLS is looking at you, it's looking at this particular spot on the airplane, this ACLS antenna. And it's kind of locked up to you and it's pinpointed and it's tracking this antenna on the airplane, essentially. Um, so when it does that, the um, ACL ready um, check light will come on. And then the pilot's got to get the airplane ready if you want a couple, that could be the end of it. If the pilot just wants to shoot a mode two approach where he's just using the ACLS needles, you know, as, as guidance needles, but he's not, has no interest in, in coupling or whatever. At that point, you're, you're kind of done, right? Um, you got the ACL ready, the plane, the, uh, the spin 42 is locked up to you. You're going to have your, your needles and you can just fly the needles um, manually. The ACLS needles, you can also fly it as an ICLS as a uh, mode uh, mode three approach um, with just the ICLS only. <clears throat> um, but let's say that uh, you wanted to couple. So the pilot's going to get the autopilot um, ready to couple. Uh, and the uh, 
you want to have the, the airplane straight and level. You has got to be some interlocks that are made. You, you want to have the flaps down, the speed brakes out, the DLC engaged, the auto throttles engaged, and it's recommended to have altitude hold on, um, although it doesn't need to be. Um, but th the point is the airplane has got to be straight and level. You cannot have any force on the control stick. If there's two or two to three pounds of force on the control stick, you will not be able to couple. Um, if uh, if um, you're not straight and level, <clears throat> you can this this the way that this system works is that there's a data link controlled electro hydraulic actuator. It's called the pitch parallel actuator, um, and it's connected. It's the connection device between the data link and the and the flight control system. There's an actuator that connects to the flight controls, um, and it's like a it's like a friction fit. It 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 can break away. Um, it's designed to break away if the ACLS uh, engages and the airplane is not straight and level. If your if your nose is high, um, if you're in a climb or a descent or whatever and you go to couple the ACLS, that pitch parallel actuator will um, will do a, a, a sharper actuation than is necessary, the system can handle, and it will break that friction fit. Um, and it can only be reset by maintenance on the ground. And so you won't be able to fly a coupled approach in that airplane until um, maintenance resets that force link in that pitch parallel actuator. So the airplane has got to be stable, configured for landing, and straight and level when you go when you when you go to couple. And when the system is ready to couple with you, the AP coupler light will come on, and then you um, put the uh, autopilot into ACL, uh, and then the um, AP reference light will light up uh, telling you that the, the autopilot is ready to be engaged and then you engage it through the nose wheel steering push button. And then when you do that, um, the ACLS will couple. It'll basically take control of the airplane and send a discrete down to the spin 42. And then the command control discrete will light up telling you that um, the data link system is now flying the airplane. Um, so that's kind of how that works. And then you reach a certain point, uh, and that typically happens at the four mile point. Um, and then you get to a certain point before the ball call and the 10 second light comes on, another discrete that comes from um, from the data link. Uh, the data link system has to get a, um, a data link message every I think it's two seconds or so from from the ground system. Um, if it does not do that, it will it will uncouple. Um, and this tilt light is for when the system detects um, errors in the uh, in in the in the messages from uh, the data link system on the boat. You'll get a you'll get a tilt light, and the system will uncouple. That's kind of what what that's all about. Um, but that's kind of how that works. And then if you're flying a mode one, you just let the whole thing sort of land you. If you're flying a mode one A, you um, do the paddle switch and uncouple, um, you know, at the ball call or before. Um, if you're flying a mode two, you're just using the needles for guidance, you know, that sort of thing. But so that's kind of how the ACLS um, system works in the Tomcat. Still on the topic of navigation, let's cover the TACAN. Um, so the TACAN is another steering um, submode for the displays. Now the TACAN, there's one TACAN system on the airplane. There's two control boxes. The pilot and the Rio each have a TACAN control box, but there's only one TACAN system. And so there's a TACAN command push button um, in each cockpit uh, for uh, the pilot or the Rio to be able to can push this button and um, be the ones you know whose control box is active. There's a little drum in the window there that'll switch between pilot and Rio, tell you who's got um, whose control box is active. Uh, it's your basic tack in. It's no different than um, the tack in in the A10 or the Hornet or 
you know, whatever. You got your you got your channels, you got receive, transmit, receive, air to air, you got your X and your Y. There's an invert normal mode that um, added uh, a whole nother set of channels. I don't know that that ever worked, that they ever used that, I, I, or um, that would be modeled. It's, it's really just the X and the X and the Y. It, it's got a bit test. Yeah, you hit the bit button, um, the needles on the, on the, PDHI, the bearing distance heading indicator, uh, would go to four degrees. I think the DME would go to two miles, if I'm not mistaken. And the go light would light up, and that was a TACAN bit test. But it, it works like TACAN in the other airplanes. Um, you'll have the course deviation indexers and the to from indicator on the HSD in the front and then the back. Um, you'll, you've also got... Um, a pointer on the BDHI analog instrument in the cockpit as well. That'll point you to the the TACAN station. There's a pointer for ADF and a pointer for the TACAN. Uh, if you got TACAN steering selected on the PDCP, you'll get your TACAN deviation bar um, on the HUD and the VDI. Now you don't get the indexer. You you won't get um, you know, like on the Hornet, the dots at four degrees and eight degrees um, of uh, of tack in, of course, deviation. You don't get that on the HUD and VDI and the Tomcat. You just get the deviation bar. If you want to have the indexer, you need to look down at the uh, at the HSD to get the indexer. And I believe in the Tomcat, each dot is six degrees. In the Hornet, they're four degrees in the in the Tomcat. Each um, each mark on the on the deviation index is six degrees, I believe. Um, but uh, but the bar will give you to or from indication. If it's a dotted line, you're from the station. If it's a solid line, you're to the station. But you don't get the dots like you do in the Hornet. But um, so that's a little bit about the TACAN. Let's talk about the other steering sub modes here briefly manual sub mode is uh, essentially you're using the um, course selection the uh, your course selection on the HSD is basically just a bug um, and you turn that wherever you want to turn it and the heading marker on the VDI will will um, will be to the left or the right depending on where <clears throat> you put that bug that's kind of manual mode um, one thing to note on the VD on the HUD and the Tomcat is you do not have an airspeed tape and an altitude tape on the HUD um, in the Tomcat. Some of you may have noticed that. You've got a vertical speed um, tape and a radar altitude tape uh, that's in uh, available in takeoff and landing modes, but you do not have um, an altitude and airspeed tape on on the HUD in the Tomcat. Just FYI. Uh, the other uh, steering sub mode is vector sub mode. That's where you're getting steering information via via the data link. It's on the VDI. You've got reference marks on the left and the right, and a set of captain's bars, um, which is your uh, commanded airspeed and altitude. And so you simply speed up or slow down to put the captain's bars, the reference mark, um, you know, in the middle of the captain's bars for airspeed, climb or descend. Uh, do the same thing for altitude. You'll have a numeric there for your commanded altitude. Um, and then again, you just kind of nestle that reference mark um, into the into the captain's bars. Uh, TACAN sub mode. Um, we went over before with the TACAN. Um, cruise mode, not much to mention there. It's really kind of a minimal set of symbology. In cruise mode, you guess you've got manual steering sub modes available. Um, destination steering sub mode available in cruise mode. Let's talk about. So the destination is the destination selected by the Rio on the TID. We talked about the eight um, uh, navigation points you can enter on the uh, on the TID. Um, so that's what destination sub mode is. Um, now the Rio has um, this little drum here that basically tells the Rio what steering mode the pilot is in. That's kind of what this does. So if the pilot selects the destination sub mode, this will show destination here on the TID showing the Rio 
um, what steering information the pilot is looking at on the on the HUD and the VDI. So uh, let's talk about some of the air to air uh, stuff. So so this is your Sparrow display. Um, it's not that different than um, uh, the Hornet. It's a little the sim symbols are different, but the information is kind of similar. So you got your target designator. You got target locked. The diamond is over your target. That's pretty standard stuff. Now you, you'll have a steering T. The steering T is um, kind of like the the ASE uh, dot. Um, on the on a Hornet HUD, if that's you know what you're used to flying, um, essentially you put the steering T uh, in the middle of the aircraft reticle, right? So maneuver the airplane, get the steering T lined up in the middle. The dot in the aircraft reticle should be at the intersection of the two lines on the steering T, um, and you're obeying the steering that the AUG nine wants you to do. On the VDI, uh, you'll have your range bars there for the missile. Um, you do not have like on the Hornet, the, uh, you know, the, the tick mark that tells you, you know, the missile will hit the target regardless of the maneuvering of the target and whatnot. The Tomcat doesn't give you that. It just gives you a maximum and minimum range mark. Now on the TID, there's a, there's a push button that the Rio can press to actually paint the uh, launch acceptability region, that contour on the TID. So the Rio can actually be looking at a graphic of the uh, the weapon envelope um, on the on the TID. But um, for the pilot, you just get tick marks for min, maximum range, and uh, your you know your current your current target range um, in between them. That's what the pilot um, is looking at. If you're too close. If you're within the minimum range for the missile, you get the breakaway um, from the AUG-9. But that's kind of what you do. You put the and that minimum maximum range is on the is on the HUD on a tape on the right, and closure is on a tape on the left. But that's kind of what you do. You put the steering T aircraft reticle on steering T. Now where that steering T will be, it may be if you don't have a weapon selected. That steering T is steering you in pure pursuit. It's basically steering you um, straight to the target if you do not have a weapon selected. If you have Sparrow or Phoenix selected, the steering T is steering you in lead pursuit um, if you have uh, a missile selected. Now, if the Rio wants to, the Rio can put you in collision pursuit. There's a button on the TID that the Rio can push um, you know if he wants to guide you through an intercept you know the target is some ways away he can put you in a collision steering and in, in on a collision course um, by pushing a button on the on the TID um, and the steering T at that point will be collision steering so uh, that's kind of how that works so that's uh, with a target tracked um, that's kind of display. This is your boresight display. If you don't have a target locked, you don't want to shoot a sparrow and just flood, you know, boresight and good luck in hitting anything with that. Um, uh, the Phoenix display is very similar um, displays for the Phoenix. Um, in fact, almost exactly the same. There's not much use in going over them because it really is very similar um, steering symbology for the Phoenix. Um, the gun, there's a manual gun mode where um, the pilot's got a little thumb wheel where he can set the elevation lead angle um, for manual gunnery. There is um, a couple different displays <clears throat> from the AUG-9. I think the only time you're ever in manual gun mode is if the AUG-9 is just completely bent um, and it's not you know, giving you anything. I don't, I don't know whenever they else would use, you know, manual gun mode. Typically you'd be using one of the, um, AUG-9, you know, base modes for the gun, the MMGS, the multiple mode gun sight. And it's kind of got two modes, um, if you got a target locked or not. So here on the left, there's a target locked. You've got the target designator and the pipper 
is um, a director solution. So you basically you put the thing in the thing. You put the pepper on the target designator, um, and you shoot. The um, the uh, um, if you don't have a target locked, the pepper and the diamond kind of form like a gun funnel type display. The pepper is where the bullets are going to be at a thousand feet of flight. The uh, diamond is where the bullets are going to be after 2,000 feet of flight. So that's kind of what that is if you don't have a target locked. Um, this, this GSS stuff, the system has this gun sight scoring system that they use in, um, you know, air to air gunnery practice. It, it, I don't know too much about it, but basically I believe it, this, um, this symbol here, the gun rounds remaining, <clears throat> I think when you squeeze the trigger in a training mode, you're not actually firing bullets. When the little imaginary bullets there get to target range, um, the uh, the gun rounds remaining flashes a seven um, when the bullets are at target range. I think that's a way of evaluating whether you would have hit the target or not. Um, um, by looking at HUD tapes, I don't. I think that's kind of what that's all about. But so that's um, the gun sight display, um, sidewinder display. Um, there's a normally the if, when you first like sidewinder, it's caged, and uh, the pepper represents the sidewinder seeker head position. Um, the, the diamond is the target, and the pepper is the aim nine seeker head position. Now you can uncage the sidewinder. It's on the throttle, kind of at your ring finger there, on the left uh, throttle quadrant. Uncage it. Now, if you have a target locked, if you uncage it, the aim nine seeker will slave to um, the target lock. If you don't have a target locked, um, the aim nine seeker does a little um, scan pattern type of thing. It's called a, I think it's called a Rosetta. Um, scan pattern and it will kind of do a little scan pattern um, if you when you uncage it it's called seam side wider expanded acquisition mode um, so that's the sidewinder displays um, what others uh, the air to ground displays I'm not super familiar with the air to ground stuff being in the f14 a you know guy we didn't do a lot of air to ground in the in the Tomcat in the time that I was there, 41 was just starting to get into some air to ground work um, uh, when I was there before I got out. But I think, you know, the gist of it is that, you know, the Tomcat, the F-14A certainly is a purely visual um, bombing system. You did not have, you know, an AT FLIR or targeting pod, you know, like they had later on. So essentially you steer the airplane and you got the bomb fall line lined up on the target and then there was a target designator the pilot has a uh, little target designating uh, target designator switch on the left hand side and you would slew the target designator um, up or down that bomb fall line put it in on the target and i think if you click it to the right or maybe it's to the left it target it designates that target and that's for the purpose of the ballistics calculations for the for the solution cues, um, the pipper is the is the impact point, um, continuously computed impact point. Um, but uh, there's an upper solution cue and a lower solution cue that initially, on the bombing run, kind of start at the top. I didn't know, this shows the velocity vector in the middle, but they would typically start above, you know, the velocity vector and work their way down as you got closer. But when the lower um, solution cue crossed the velocity vector, um, assuming you got the velocity vector on the bomb fall line, which is kind of what you want to do. Um, you're at maximum tar uh, bomb range. So that's the point that if you wanted to do a loft bombing type technique, when that lower, lower solution cue hits that velocity vector, you could reach that target with that bomb if you executed you know, a pull up, if you were doing a loft bomb. Um, the upper solution cue is basically the instantaneous target or bomb um, range, ballistic range, and essentially 
when the upper solution queue met the velocity vector, if you were in a computer bombing mode, that's when this system would release the bomb if you were holding the pickle button down, is when that upper solution queue met the velocity vector. So that's the gist of the bombing displays on, on the Tomcat. I don't know all the ins and outs of each mode that you can bomb in and, and um, what the symbology does you know, in those modes. Um, I'll leave it um, to the guys that are going to get the Tomcat early and can do some videos on that. I just um, did not have a lot of experience in um, air-to-ground bombing on the Tomcat. So that's all I'll talk about on the on the air to ground modes and that's kind of the gist of it but so um rounded out here with the uh, hsd and the cmd uh, dis displays they're very similar if you are got used to using those um on the hornet uh, the hsi um the, and the tomcat you know, it'll really function uh, exactly the same so there's an hsd in the front seat uh, there's a we called it the ECMD in the back seat. Both of them have a HSI display mode as well as an ECM mode in the F14A. There wasn't a separate indicator for the the radar warning system. Um, it came up on the HSI, HSI or ECMD. It was either displaying nav information or it was displaying um, radar warning receiver information. <clears throat> um, and the gist of it is that um, uh, you can have the uh, ECM display um, override the nav display. There's a selection there to have uh, the nav display, you know, overridden by um, missile launch or airborne intercept um, alerts from the radar warning receiver system. Uh, there's a correlate switch here that... Um, there was actually two separate systems. It was the ALR-45 and the ALR-50. The ALR-45 was the radar warning receiver, um, and it was a pretty basic system. It displayed strobes on on the uh, the ECM display that would correspond to the direction that that radar energy was coming from. The strobes had a dot dash pattern to dis to tell you whether it was a low, medium, or high PRF um, uh, radar that it was detecting. And basically the length of the strobe um, corresponded to the strength of the signal it was getting. And then the direction corresponded to the direction. That's kind of how that worked. And there was a separate system for a missile launch or missile alert um, indications. That was the ALR-50, a separate system. Um, but what, uh, and that was just kind of a light that lit up uh, on the on the cockpit in the front along, next to the HUD. There was a, some ladder lights there that lit up and one in the back seat as well for missile alert or missile launch indications from that ALR-50. But there was a correlate mode where um, it, the system would attempt to correlate that missile alert or that missile launch to with the ALR-45 um, with what it was receiving and display uh, the appropriate um, the strobe on the ECMD that was the source of that missile alert missile launch. That's kind of what that did. Um, that was another selection. And the other switches are just to put it in NAV or ECM mode. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, how the uh, HST ECMD worked in the Tomcat. All right, here I'm just looking at the right-hand console and seeing um, that we went over everything. Um, this was the uh, discussion we just had. This was the ECM control box here. You had switches to um, to show or defeat the low, medium, and high PRF um, strobes on the ECM display. This was the, uh, the volume control um, there was a switch here to show or defeat um, uh, um, system interpreted uh, AAA. Uh, this was the power. There was some test switches here. You did a test. I think it just threw a threw a strobe up on the display um, as a as a test. Um, so that was the ECM control box. I there's these these systems are not part of the main NATOPS. They're part of a uh, 
supplemental NATOPs, the yellow NATOPs, um, that is not public. I believe it's unclassified at this point, but have not been able to get a hands on a copy of that. Um, I'm hoping that uh, Heepler got their hands on it. It would certainly help them, but um, but there is not a yellow NATOPs out there to be found um, from what I can find. And that's where a lot of these systems are in, which is why I don't have anything any more detailed than this to 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 go over. I'm sure um, the uh, the regular YouTubers will be able to kind of demonstrate that to you when they get their hands on the on the Tomcat. Um, the next control box down is the Deceptive ECM, the ALQ100, which is what the F um, the F14A used, and we did not use it, and that system simply did not work um we didn't even hook it up we had it in the airplane for weight and balance reasons um but we bagged the connectors and tied them off to the side and never even hooked the thing up because it was known to be a non-working system it would draw the enemy to you as opposed to um to working as a as an electronic countermeasure um, whenever the crews were going on across country we'd take the thing out and they would use that as a baggage area, you know, put their personal baggage in there, um, what have you. But the ALQ-100 uh, was a completely uh, useless system in the F-14A, um, and we just never, never touched it. But that's what this control box um, is for. Um, the next ones down were the ALE-39, you know, the chaff and flare dispense. It could also do jammers. We, we never did. Um, it was really just about um, chaff and flare. Um, below here is the uh, the sequencer control. Uh, this is where you dial in through these thumb wheels. It's just it's a lot like what you put in on the Hornet or whatever. Um, you know, for the uh, interval and the quantity. Well, this is the same thing. You're just doing it through these thumb wheels here. Here, there's bursts and salvos. So the the salvo is the larger you know package. Uh, the salvo contains one or more bursts of chaff or flares. That's the just the nomenclature that this particular system uses. But you enter those quantities and intervals with these um, thumb wheels down here. Um, there's a, uh, you can, the Rio can initiate uh, chaff or flare, single or program through uh, these switches here. Now the Rio also has some four-way hat switches on the DDD handle. So as he's up there, he's got his hand on that DDD and he's cranking himself around to look at, uh, you know, the target, you know, and after the merge and what have you. Uh, he's got hat switches up there where he can be pumping out um, chaff or flares as he's grabbing onto that DDD handle and sort of yanking himself around. It's actually a pretty good place um, for those types of controls, that DDD handle. So he can initiate chaff and flare singles and programs here on the control box and also via the hat switch um, on the DDD handle. Um, he can salvo flares uh, down here. You need to just kind of dump them all um, if you're an extremist. Um, you can also, there's a flare mode here. The pilot has uh, a button at his thumb, um, chaff dispense, or it can also be for flares as well based on where the Rio has set this um, flare mode switch. So that pilot button can be used to dispense chaff or flares based on the position of this switch. So that kind of rounds out uh, the right console. Looking at the left console, um, talked about, this is the radios. I didn't go over the radios. I mean, I think we all um, you know, are familiar with how you know, radios work. This is the ARC-182 here, VHF, UHF radio, which was in the later uh, F-14As, got upgraded with the ARC-182. <clears throat> um, this is antenna selections for the radio, nothing worth going over in detail there. This is the ICS control box to put the ICS, um, and it has two amplifiers, a normal one, a backup. You can switch it to backup here. Um, you can put it in hot mic here. Um, the ICS and the radios are actually implemented via the foot switches in the rear cockpit. There's foot switches at the pilot's left foot as for the ICS, and his right foot is for the radio. And which radio he's keying with that right foot um, is selected um, here on this control box. That's what that's what those are. This one here is the KY28. 
uh, for the uh, encryption of the of the radios. Um, this is your sensor control panel. We'll talk about this for a little bit. I think I have a another picture of the close up of the sensor control panel. Oh, and this is the best one I could find. I think it's from another game, actually. The um, that models the F14 somewhat. So this is the sensor control panel. It's got controls for the uh, AUG9 antenna. Um, it's got a little elevation center control to set the center point of the radar's elevations. Got one for the azimuth um, as well. Um, it's got a setting for the number of elevation bars and the azimuth scan. I think we're all familiar with, with um, those types of functions from the Hornet. Um, stab in and out is for to have the uh, radar antenna be um, or stabilized or not, you know, to have it sweep along the horizon or sweep along the uh, the lateral axis of the airplane. That's what um, stabilization is for. VSL is one of your dogfight modes. It's a synonymous with uh, vertical acquisition in the Hornet. You can have VSL high and low. Um, it's a momentary thing. You just flick it. Uh, in fact, our air crews, they didn't like how short this switch was. They're in a dogfight. They need to flick that thing. They don't feel like hunting for it. So we always, they had us, um, we put up some heat shrink tubing on it to kind of extend the length of it so they could just reach over and thwack it and put it in um, VSL, you know, high or low. So that's what that is. These other set of controls down here are for the, the TCS. So to talk about the TCS for a little bit. TCS television camera system, um, pretty basic system. Um, you know, it's displayed on the TID. It can only be so good. The TID is like a green phosphor type display. So it's kind of shades of green. It's not a, like a multicolor display um, or anything like that in the F-14A. It's, it's a television camera. It's got two um, levels of zoom. Uh, narrow field of view is uh, 10x magnification. Wide field of view is is 4x. Um, it's not in the main natops, so I don't have a good pictures um, to show you. But you'd slit, you'd uh, the you'd move the, uh, the TCS around with the hand control unit in the rear cockpit. One of the uh, tiles next to the hand control unit is. Um, for the IRTV, it's got a separate on-off switch on the hand control unit as well. So you, you turn the thing on, it takes about two minutes or so to warm up, and then uh, you can put the TCS display on the uh, on the VDI in the front and on the TID in the back, um, and you can uh, and you can lock uh, things up with it. It's got different acquisition modes. The TCS display has two crosshairs. It has a rack and a gack. The rack is the radar angle crosshair. It's a it's a a, a pipper with dotted lines, and it's got a, a, a gimbal angle crosshair, which is the crosshair that shows you where the TCS gimbal is. They're they're solid lines, and in the middle of it, it's got a little acquisition gate symbol. It's got it's like kind of like four dots, and if you get um, the target, you know some contrast in that in that acquisition gate in the middle, um, the TCS will lock up to it and track it. Um, uh, it's got acquisition modes for manual. Uh, manual acquisition mode, the, the Rio's got to use the hand control unit, uh, get the get the target in the middle of that um, acquisition window in the center, and then go full action, and then lock it up. Uh, if it's in auto, the Rio's just got to get um, the target into the acquisition window when the TCS system gets some contrast in that acquisition window it'll lock up to it automatically auto search is um, the TCS will do a little scan pattern and when any contrast appears in that acquisition win window bam it'll it'll lock up to it so that's kind of how the TCS works. Um, the main, and, not, and then also to slave. So you can slave the radar to the TCS. You can slave the TCS to the radar, or you can have them be independent. The most common way that the TCS was used is to slave the TCS to the radar to be able to get a quick visual ID from pretty far out of whatever, of what you had locked up. Right, so you typically have the TCS slave to the radar. 
you lock something up, you can look down at the TID, you'd put it in auto acquisition. So um, the TCS would lock up uh, um, to whatever you know you're looking at with the radar, um, and then go to you know narrow field of view at 10x, and you can get a reasonably good visual ID to target. Our air crews would say they could get a decent visual ID out at 20 miles or so with uh, with the TCS. I know that the book probably tells you it's good for a lot farther than that. Our, our, my air crews that I worked with would tell me that you know typical visual IDs with the TCS were were 20 miles. So that is really mainly how they used um, the TCS. Now um, you know you can try and use it as you know. Um, turn the radar off and use it like a MIG and as an electro-optical sensor and try and lock up the stuff that way. Um, I believe if you got something locked with the TCS and you go to cage seam, the sidewinder will slave to that that diamond. The diamond on the HUD will be a t will be the TCS lock, the TCS line of sight. If you have a TCS lock but not a radar lock, um, but the the TCS has a very small sort of gimbal limit. Uh, I believe it's 30 degrees in azimuth and 22 degrees in elevation. Um, and slowing it around with that hand control unit is not the easiest thing in the world. So um, I don't know that uh, you're going to find much success in using uh, the TCS in that sort of a in that sort of a tactic. Um, you know, I don't I haven't I didn't hear stories of our Tomcat air crews talking about that was one of the ways that they used it, but uh, it might work that way you can always give it a shot but the, the main use case really is for visual IDing what you've got locked up um, with the radar uh, these trims here are for trimming the thing um, so what you would do is you'd single target track um, a target you'd make sure acquisition was in manual so it wouldn't automatically lock up to anything but so single target track something slay the TCS to it put it in um, the wide field of view and and then use these trim wheels to um, center um, your single target track target into the middle of that acquisition window with these trim um, dials here. That's kind of what they were used for. So that's the little something on the on the TCS, and that um, I believe rounds out the left hand console there. Um, <clears throat> some of the other things in the center console here that I haven't talked about yet uh, talked about um, everything here really except the CI so let's talk about the CI a little bit and the jettison system on the Tomcat so this is the CI it's part of a subsystem called the AUG 15 now a lot of the things on here are kind of what you do in the upfront controller and the Hornet if you're you know sort of used to flying that um, this is the air to ground sort of corner up here now that's where you choose your weapon type. It'll list all the, it's got a drum in here that'll show all the different types of, of air to ground ordnance that uh, the plane can carry. So you just uh, choose um, what you're currently dropping uh, on the weapon type. The attack mode is for um, uh, kind of what I was talking about with either, well, kind of like if you want to do CCIP or CCRP bombing, these are the uh, F-14 terms for those. And so the Rio will select what type of um, attack mode symbology um, that you're going to do for delivering, you know, air to ground weapons. Um, so that's kind of how that works. That's what that's for. Um, electrical fusing, just like you do on the upfront controller in the Hornet, except it's a dial. Um, this is for your, you know, delivery modes of steps or uh, single or pairs and steps or ripple and your fusing type uh, you know nose nose tail you know very I think we're, most of us will be familiar with that these are your delivery um, intervals and quantities for air to ground uh, a lot of f14a air crews never touched any of those switches that I just just talked about um, at least not up till the early 90s or so when they started bombing with the with the Tomcat to keep it alive, um, the uh, these other uh, switches here are for your jettison. So um, if you want to jettison 
um, your ordnance, you select it with with these switches here. Stations two and seven are your tanks. One B and eight B are your your wing um, pylons. You cannot just like the Hornet, you can't jettison sidewinders, right? You can only jettison um, one B and eight B, whether they be Sparrow or Phoenix if you're carrying Phoenix out there. Three, four, five, and six are your belly stations, whether they be Sparrows or Phoenix. So you just you just select what stations you want to jettison, and then the pilot can jettison them um, from the front seat uh, with the uh, ACM jet push button. The Rio can jettison them from the back seat um, with the uh, select jet uh, button. He can choose to jettison the whole rack if he wants to uh, through the jet options. Um, that's kind of how jettison works. Pretty pretty simple um, system. Um, there's the air-to-air -air launch push button. If the pilot has um, uh, a good launch uh, interlocks are all made, the sparrows are tuned, you got single target track, you got, you got, the pilot has a hot trigger in the front seat, the Rio's launch light will be lit up. The Rio can launch Phoenix and Sparrow. The pilot can launch Phoenix or Sparrow with the trigger, but the Rio can also launch them uh, with this button here, it'll be lit up for um, Phoenix and Sparrows. Um, what else is on here? Next launch, uh, the the Aug Nine will choose the next station um, to launch. You can uh, use this to override that um, and choose the next launch station yourself. Um, missile speed gate uh, is uh, it's a missile selection for. Um, You'd kind of choose this based on what aspect you're going to be launching uh, the missile in. I think, by and large, crews left it in wide, but uh, you can um, choose it, uh, enable different Doppler filters in the missile for um, what aspect you're going to be launching that missile in. That's kind of what the speed gate is for. Um, for the life of me, I can't remember what these options are. It's in the yellow natop somewhere, but. Uh, um, I'm not remembering them, so I can't I can't talk to what what that is. Um, this came later. This is a sort of self test that the CI would would do and give you some fault codes in there. They weren't. This wasn't on there um, in the time that I was working the Tomcat, but um, just reading the Natops, that's kind of what this is. You hit a test button, and you get different fault codes that could um, pop up here on the CI. So so that's the CI. Um, what else? I think that's it. I think that pretty much rounds out um, the avionics in, in the rear cockpit. I know I've been going on for a long time. Uh, I'll try and edit this down. Uh, looking at it now, I'm at like two hours here. So if you're seeing this and it's not two hours long, I've, I've edited it down because um, I've been going on for a while. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that gives you some idea of what uh, the avionics in the, in the Tomcat is like. And um, thanks for listening.